morning and welcome to worship on this beautiful fall day, this October 18th. Welcome all. I hope that you've been able to take some time and notice the beauty of this fall season. Okay, I have to show you this one. I just saw this movement on the top of the mantle. I didn't know what it was, so you caught me looking over there. So I guess the cat's up there. Welcome to worship. It is good to worship together. It is good to take time out of each week and out of each day to think about where God fits into the world and where we allow God in our lives. So this morning we're going to talk about um, a story from Matthew 22. It is a story about, as this topic on the scripture says, paying the imperial tax to Caesar. It's a story about a situation that happens with Jesus and people that are trying to trap him and trying to um, get him in trouble, asking who he serves. So hopefully in this time, wow, sorry, had to have a little time out. Back to what we're doing today in this service is we're going to look at Jesus' challenge to us to serve God and render unto Caesar those things that are Caesar's and unto God those things that are God. To try to identify in our lives if we have things in our lives that are more important than God. And if we do, maybe we need to reevaluate our priorities and um, work at moving God up on the list of things that make a difference to us. So that's the, the topic that we're going to talk about and the challenge that we're going to be left with. So now let us together joyfully worship Almighty God. This is the call to worship. The heavens are telling the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of God's hands. Day and night return endlessly, showing God's steadfast love. The sun shines upon the earth, reflecting God's light. The law of God is perfect, reviving the soul. The decrees of God brings wisdom, making wise the pure of heart. The heavens are telling the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of God's hands. Come, let us worship the living God. Welcome for the opening prayer. Holy God, we come to you for hope and care. We come with our concerns and our struggles. We look to you for guidance and direction. Open our ears so that we might hear what you have for us today. Open our hands to serve you in the world. May we work to reflect Christ in all that we do and say. Amen. Take this time to remember those in our church family. Take time to email, call, write cards to people, and greet them with genuine affection of Christian love. And pass along the peace of Christ in whatever creative way you might see possible. Take this time to look over your last week and notice times when you were not focused on God. Times when fear overcame your trust and hope in God. Here's our prayer of confession. God of new life and God of hope, forgive us when fears and despair occupy our focus. Embolden our faith when we feel out of control and we feel far away from you. Strengthen us and give us courage to focus on your light and your promise for a future that is good. In hope and trust we pray, amen. Each week in our service, we ask for forgiveness. We pray the prayer of confession. And following that prayer, we are assured that God forgives us. It is nothing that we have earned. It isn't anything we've even deserved. It is something that God, out of the grace and mercy of Almighty God, offers us. And this is truly the good news 
of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Introduction of the Word. We are about to read the Word of the Lord. Listen for the Word that stands the test of time. Listen for the Word that lives and moves among us. Listen for the Word that God is speaking to us this day. Our scripture passage for today is taken from Matthew 22, starting with verse 15 and reading through verse 22. The title, the subtitle in this passage is Paying the Imperial Tax to Caesar. Then the Pharisees went out and laid plans to trap him in his words. They sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians. Teacher, they said, we, knew that you, we know that you are a man of integrity and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. You aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are. Tell us then, what is your opinion? Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? But Jesus, knowing their evil intent, said, You hypocrites! Why are you trying to trap me? Show me the coin used for paying the tax. They brought him a denarius, and they asked him, and he asked them, Whose image is this, and whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Then he said to them, So give back to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. When they heard this, they were amazed. So they left him, and they went away. This ends the reading of God's holy word. Thanks be to God. Dear God, may your words be found in these words. Help us to hear what you have for us this day so that we might apply it to our lives and serve you more completely. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I have an older cousin who is 10 years older than I am. 
He is part of a family that grew up in Pakistan. My uncle and aunt were missionaries. So his family lived in Pakistan and he was in college at this time in this uh, sermon that I'm going to tell you about. He was at, at Westminster and whenever there was a vacation, he would stay at our house. So it was vacation time and I loved him. I mean, I, I just followed him around as a little eight-year-old kid or nine-year-old kid um, when he was a freshman in college. And if he talked to me, I thought that was great. So he would um, have this game and it was about heads or tails. And he would flip a coin and he said at the beginning of the game, heads I win, tails you lose. And then he'd flip it and I would call. So he'd get the coin, heads I win, tails you lose, flip it, came down, I called heads and it said, heads, I win. Then he'd flip it again a little later and it came down and I called tails and he goes, tails, you lose. Heads I win, tails you lose. It took me four years to realize that I was getting cheated. This story today is about a, a group of people who are trying to trap Jesus. Fortunately, Jesus is not a nine-year-old kid who didn't get it. Jesus understands completely what's going on. We look at this pericope, this passage, and it is in Matthew 22. Now, when we look at the Gospels, we know that each of the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, are books about the life of Jesus. So as we're getting to the end of those books, we know that we're getting toward the end of Jesus' life. This is uh, chapter 22, which is almost the end of his writing. So we know that some things are starting to happen now that are going to be um, challenging to Jesus' life. We know that he's in Jerusalem. That tells us another thing, and that is that um, he has done most of his ministry around the area um, in the countryside. And when he goes back to Jerusalem, we know that he's going to confront some people that do not like him and that want to hurt him. So he's back in Jerusalem. He's at the temple area, and he has a conversation with some people. And these people are Pharisees. And then it also mentions in the first verse that I read that there are also some Herodians there. And it says clearly they have come to trap Jesus. It's interesting, we don't know too much about the Herodians, but we know by that name that they followed Herod. So they weren't strict Jewish people. They were people who sided with the Roman Empire and not people who are going to be friends with most of the Jewish leaders or even the Jewish people. So we read here that they are plotting against Jesus. It's interesting also to note that this group of people, um, the Pharisees and the Herodians, would never have really been together unless they were together to try to get Jesus. It would be not unlike a group of white supremacist nationalists and a group from Black Lives Matter joining together for the destruction of another person. These, these two groups didn't get along, didn't have anything in common except their hatred and their aggression to try to get rid of Jesus. So we're, we're here in this story and they have confronted Jesus as he's teaching at the temple and they're saying, uh, tell us, tell us um, who you have allegiance to. It actually kind of starts out with the Eddie Haskells of the New Testament. They're pretending to be interested in the teachings of Jesus, and they start out, Jesus, teacher, we know you are sincere and teach the way of God in accordance with truth and show deference to no one. And all the time they're just trying to trip him up, and Jesus knows that, and Jesus says, um, you hypocrites, show me a coin. And so they took a coin out, and it was interesting because what the coin that they took was a denarius, Denarius is not used in the temple. Shekels were used in the temple for um, the Jewish people. So number one, this is a, a coin that connects to the Roman Empire. And we know that if he says he follows this coin or Caesar, that he is in trouble with all the people he has 
um, spoken to who are Jews and religious people. If he says he is supportive of the religious coin or that that he follows God, then the Roman Empire's people, the Romans in charge, will probably arrest him for treason. So there's no answer here. Um, he calls for this coin, and his answer is, let things that belong to Caesar be Caesar's, and things that belong to God be God's. One thing about this coin is it had the Tiberius Pontius Maximus. That is the image that was on the front of this coin. The coins were basically for propaganda to um, continuously remind people who's in charge, whoever has their picture on the money, and that were ruling emperors at that time, was a constant reminder of who had the power and who was in control and that you were to follow and you were to obey that person. So here Jesus' answer is brilliant. Um, he doesn't deny that there's an obligation to the civil following of Caesar, but he also adds, give to God what is God's. And this kind of stops the conversation. They, they just go home. It's interesting that he did this, that he called for a coin, that he pointed this out in the big picture. Jesus' point is everything belongs to God. We've heard that it's impossible to serve two masters. So part of that thinking is that we need to decide who it is that we are following. In this answer, Jesus states that our focus is to give God all of the things that are God's, which clearly Jesus feels is everything. Everything we have connects to God. We as followers of Christ are called to live out every part of our lives in service to God and thankfulness to God, however we do that in our own lives. So how do we get started? Well, we might want to start by just being aware of the complications in our lives, the different things that are pulling us different directions. Just have eyes to see what it is that's competing with our following God. Um, there may be things that we're doing in our lives that are good and they're helpful, but they overcome our ability to actually connect with areas of our lives that God has a plan for. Um, this whole passage might be a question of authority. By what authority do you do things and under whose authority do you respond? Jesus reminds us that God is over everything, that God is in all things, that God is all authority over heaven and earth. So what in your life belongs to God that you're keeping separate? How can you use your life to serve God? Maybe you use your life to serve God by being an encourager, or maybe your organizational skills are what help you serve God. Maybe you are a thinker, you're a starter, you're an innovator. Use that to serve God. Maybe you are a hands-on worker and the way that you are serving God is by physically helping others. Maybe you serve God because you are one of God's prayers, that you are someone who holds people's joys and sadnesses in your prayers. Maybe you're a giver. Maybe you have the ability financially to support um, the church, to support mission projects. Maybe that is how you are serving God. Whatever you withhold from God, and sometimes whether you know you're doing this or not, that gets in the way of serving God. We are at the beginning of a stewardship time. Uh, most churches put together budgets this time of year, as we do. This week you got a letter that indicated that you have the opportunity now to fill out 
a pledge card and send it in. I want to talk about that for a second because I think it fits in with this scripture passage. This act of kindness by the way that you invest your money is an act of thanksgiving. A tithe is not a bill that you have to pay. It's not an obligation. It is a response to the love that you have seen in your life from God. It's a way of saying thank you to God for everything that you have had in your life. 10% of everything is given to God. Uh, probably 10% of your time, 10% of your finances, 10% of your studies. 10% is a tithe that you might want to think about different parts of your lives and how are you giving 10% to God or dedicating or focusing on. When we pay taxes, we don't usually send a thank you note with our return. Um, even though we do get something back, probably from our taxes, our, our streets, our uh, police, our different groups that are covered by our government. But Jesus is saying here, pay, pay to the ruling officials what is required to pay, pay your taxes. And now with God, your response is not out of law or fear. It is out of a response to the love that Christ has given that God has shown us. So if you would get flowers on your anniversary, if, if someone has an anniversary and the person that you're um, married to or dating brings you flowers and presents the flowers to you and says, this is our anniversary, so I know I have to get you flowers. So here it is, I love you. Probably not gonna go over well. But if you just receive a gift of flowers or a candle or something, Clark's Donuts. Well, Clark's Donuts, actually, I don't really care what the person says. Just give me the donuts. I don't really care what you say there. But anyway, if you um, say, I just want you to have this because I love you, because you mean so much to me, and I'm trying to figure out some small way to let you know how much I appreciate all that you are in my life. That's what matters. That's what we do when we give to the church. This is not a bill. Do not pay out of guilt. We don't want guilt money in the church. We want your thank you. Your thank you to God for all that you see God doing in the world, all that you see God doing in your life. It is a response. Jesus is saying, this is a response to what God has been to the world and in your life. One thing that we are very clear about in the reform theology is that giving is not something where you anticipate getting blessed for. We do not believe in the prosperity Bible where I'm going to give this money and you're going to get a car. You're going to win the lottery. We don't see God saying that. We don't see that we're giving this money for benefit of our own. We're giving this to say thank you. If somebody gives you a gift and you know there are strings attached to that gift, it isn't a gift, it's a purchase. So by giving in this stewardship time, by pledging and dedicating a tenth of your life, a portion of what you have, in response to a God that has said and showed you that God loves you, it is a joy to give. It get, makes you stronger, and it it is a joy to see that live out and um, become active in the church and in your life. God is God of every part of our lives. And I think one of the things that this passage reminds me of is to think of different parts of my life, different parts of your life, and how are you um, sharing that with God? Are there parts that are totally separate from God? And if there are, you need to maybe look at that and see if that's something you want to be continuing. If there are parts where you include God in every level of your, your day, continue to do that. 
joyfully. So God is in every part of your life. We need to be aware of that and respond to it. Respond to the idea that God is in the conversation around the table, that God is, this one's a hard one, with you when you're driving. God is with you when you're angry. And how are you responding? We are not going to be able to do this the way we really want to. We're going to have times where we aren't good at representing God. But this kind of passage allows us to focus again on God being in every part of our lives and how we are noticing that and how that changes us. Not because God is watching to see when we're going to make a mistake, but because God is there to encourage us to make our lives more complete. Um, notice how much you care for others. Notice how many times you study about God or look for God. Notice the times that you are caring for others and work on that. God, Jesus is asking who we serve in this passage. So let's take this week and notice how we are living out our lives, how we desire to serve God and how that looks Notice your time, notice your studies, your conversations, your interactions with others, your successes, notice your failures, times you learned about God, learned that God loved you through the failures. Notice your heart, notice your actions, and make an intentional attempt to serve God in all that you do. One of the things that we talked about in choir in the times where we recorded music this week was how looking at the words to the hymns have made a difference to each of us as we were um, talking about the depth of theology that we gain from our hymns. One of the things I think we can do is to notice even in the time that we're in in this pandemic where we can't sing out loud in church. That's so hard to not do that. But where we see God working is in the fact that we quietly sit and read the words to the hymns. And some of those hymns have given us meaning that we haven't seen before. Actually, half the time I realize that's what that says. I've been singing the song wrong for the last so many years. But take, take time to notice that even through struggles, even through a difficult time that we're in right now, Notice where God is with us, where God is encouraging us, and take time to thank God, whether that be in the way that we give back financially or the way that we give back um, in connecting with our community, with the community out there, and how, how we live our lives glorifying God and saying thank you. So love God with all your heart, with all that you think and learn, with all of your soul, with all of your strength, and love others as yourself. This is our goal to live out this lesson that God is a God of every part of your life. And may God bless you as you work to have eyes to see places where you are thankful to God and respond in joyful thanks. Amen.
Good morning. These are the prayers of the people. Take this quiet time to pray in your home. Write names of people to pray for during this next week. Please remember people from our congregation who are sick or who are struggling. Remember to thank God for all that we have and pray for those who are having a difficult time in life right now. We continue to remember Gerd Adelsberger at the death of Frank. We also pray for Wendell Sowers and his family at the death of Nancy. We continue to pray for Shirley and JR. We continue to pray for essential workers, for families, for our country, those with illness, those struggling with economic challenges, people who will feel afraid and alone, the helpers, the church in the world, those in our church family who are struggling, people who feel left out, those who are discouraged and disenfranchised, help them to know your strength and care, God. God, be with the people in Beirut, Lebanon, as they struggle to put lives back together after the horrific explosion. Also, we pray for the people of the Midwest in Iowa, whose farms and properties were damaged in the tornadoes, the people in Louisiana who have been affected by the recent hurricane, and those who suffer loss from the fires in California. We continue to pray for schools, for students and teachers as they work to educate, and we pray for safety and strength for all of them. May we work to notice the gifts that we have and find ways to use those gifts to serve you, God. We continue to pray for people living out Christ's call to serve and care for others as we move into the world with God's message of inclusion and care.
and offering. Your offering envelopes have the church address, 215 East Bissell Avenue, on each envelope. Please put a stamp on it and mail it to the church. Your offering is a blessing and is important to the well-being of the church. Thank you. Let us pray. Dear God, we come to you with a spirit of gratitude for all that we have received. We strive to live each day with an attitude of thankfulness. May we serve you not only with our financial commitment, but with our lives as we work to, to love God and love each other every day. Amen. As you receive the benediction, go out now having eyes to see how God is interacting in each day. Take time to notice where your priorities are and let us all work at making God the most important thing in the day and maybe identifying some things that keep us from that. And as you do that, as you work to live out that assignment for the week, for the life, for your life. May you go with the peace and grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the encouragement, the wisdom, and the defense of the Holy Spirit, and the love and mercy of Almighty God go with you now and forevermore. Amen.